Welcome to Public Health Cyber War Games, How Hackers Are Exploiting Healthcare. My name is Caleb Barlow, and I'm the CEO of Synergistic. We're a services organization with a large practice in healthcare security and privacy, operating in about a thousand hospitals. I'm joined today by Robin Ford. Robin, please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Robin Ford. I'm the manager of information system security at Talamar Health. I have over 15 years of combined information technology and cybersecurity experience and over 30 years experience in healthcare. So in today's session, we're going to start by baselining the current situation in healthcare with a specific focus on the kinetic impact that ransomware is having on patient care. We'll look at several recent breaches and give you some insights, not only into what's been captured in the press, but also what's actually going on inside a hospital from both a business and a clinical perspective when a hospital loses access to their electronic medical records. We're then gonna switch gears and talk about the new threats in healthcare from attempted attacks on the cold chain and vaccine production to genomic testing and the concerns over how we secure it. We'll end with a focus on actions that you can take away and lessons learned throughout the pandemic that could be applied to any institution, not only healthcare. So let's start with the situation report. The threat in the healthcare is no longer primarily focused on data exfiltration and the loss of patient records. Not that that issue has subsided, but it's been eclipsed by a far more impactful threat, ransomware, that is focused on locking up electronic medical records, literally the lifeblood of how a healthcare system operates. Now, ransomware, interestingly enough, has its roots in healthcare. So an interesting historical fact, the first ransomware attack called the AIDS Trojan was created by bi biologist Joseph Propp, who handed out 20,000 infected discs to attendees of the World Health Organization's AIDS conference. Now, when your files were locked up, you had to send a ransom payment via the mail to a PO box in Panama. Needless to say, this was not the most effective method of ransomware payment, but it was the start of this entire industry. So healthcare data breaches increased by 2,733% over the last decade. And healthcare has been targeted, but this only got worse during the pandemic. But I want you to start by putting yourself in the shoes of the adversary. So let's face it, 2020 was a hell of a year for just about everyone. But what impact did COVID-19 have on the ne'er-do-wells? Remember, there's a person on the other side of this, and cybercrime is estimated to be a $1.5 trillion industry. Now, let's just put this in perspective. The GDP of, oh, let's say, Ireland is only $328 billion. So has this cybercrime industry shut down? Has it been impacted? Oh, yes, it has. Remember that travel, entertainment, retail, and education were all major targets for adversarial activity, both nation state and organized crime, but they were all shut down. It's not like a closed retailer is gonna pay a ransom if their systems get locked up. So the bad guys had to change their targets. And well, healthcare was an industry that was still open. So let's boil this down. If you went to the doctor's office in 2019 in the United States, you had, get this, a 12.5% chance that your medical record would be disclosed or stolen in a single year. And that's before the pandemic. The hasty rollout of telemedicine and the movement of healthcare back to move the healthcare back office to work from home and remote. Imagine if I told you that you had a 12.5% chance of contracting a MRSA infection if you went to the doctor. Would you go? So why is this happening? Why target healthcare versus let's say a bank or an energy company? Well, I think most of us are probably familiar with the NIST cybersecurity framework. And, and I recognize that it was never intended to be a scorecard, but follow along with me for a minute. If we assume a maturity level of a three on a one to five scale is minimally acceptable, which I think most of you that are security professionals would agree with, then 66% of America's healthcare providers cannot get to that level, 66%. And that is not a new problem. This has been an ongoing problem for years. Now, this is not to say that healthcare providers are not investing in security, quite the opposite. They're just not investing fast enough to keep up with the adversary. 
And in many cases, including the latest data from 2019, they're actually starting to fall slightly behind. So healthcare is open, healthcare is vulnerable, and healthcare is heavily insured with cyber insurance and likely to pay a ransom. So now let's look at some of the marquee breaches of 2020 that impacted healthcare and what we learned from them. So to kind of set the stage here at the start of the pandemic, reporters from Bleeping Computer reached out to multiple ransomware gangs and started asking them if they would attack healthcare during a time when ICUs were overloaded. Now, here are some of the replies. I'm not gonna read them all, but you get the idea. No, we're not gonna attack healthcare during a pandemic. Well, of course we can take these folks for their word, right? Unfortunately, I think some CISOs might have actually believed them. So let's take a look at some of the big breaches over the last year and a half and how they started to shape our view of ransomware. We start with VCPI in November of 2019. Now they run the IT systems for 100 clients that service 2,400 nursing homes in 45 states. When hit with ransomware, they decided to decline to pay the ransom, reported to be $14 million. It took down their EMR, electronic medical records, email and phone service. So this was a cloud provider that had frankly, a large blast radius, including hundreds of nursing homes all at once. When they refused to pay the bad guys, the bad guys started releasing sensitive data. This is the first of what we now know as double extortion. In other words, pay up or we're gonna release your data. Then we move to UHS. Now, UHS occurred in September of 2020. And up to this incident, attacks on healthcare were generally limited to a hospital or a clinic or an office at a time. Not that these attacks did not historically have a significant impact, but again, the blast radius was, well, relatively small. Understand targeting is not random with these groups. They spend time picking targets. So when UHS was taken down, this impacted around 250 of their 400 locations in the middle of a pandemic, taking out their entire IT system, including the phones. The adversary was knowingly attempting to take down an entire system, knowing that they would have a catastrophic impact on patient care across the entire system. Now, the good news is this breach, it does not appear they made it into the electronic medical records as they apparently were outsourced to a cloud provider. Now, in my opinion, this is the breach that crosses the Rubicon in terms of adversarial intent. Had they gotten into the electronic medical records, it would have been far worse. Even then, the overall breach cost is estimated to be around 67 million dollars. Now we get to Dusseldorf University Clinic. So this is in Germany and a patient allegedly dies due to an emergency room diversion to another facility 20 miles away brought on by a ransomware incident. Now there's some reporting questioning the accuracy of this attribution, but regardless, there's no doubt at that at this point, ransomware is impacting patient care when it comes to a ransomware incident. And then we get to the University of Vermont Health Network in 2020. Now we've got to set the stage here. In October, of, uh, in October 29th, CISA, the FBI, the Department of Health and Human Services were warning of a significant attack on the healthcare sector with more than 400 healthcare institutions in the crosshairs. Now, by the time the dust settles, there were about a dozen hospitals impacted the most significant of which was the University of Vermont Health System, where the adversary was successful in taking down the electronic medical record system. It was so devastating that the Vermont governor deployed the National Guard to help with the remediation. The overall anticipated cost of just the situation at Vermont, not even the other hospitals, was $64 million. They had to furlough 300 employees because they had nothing to do. 5,000 computers, 1,500 servers were impacted. The most significant impact was to emergency oncology and imaging. And this breach got everyone in healthcare thinking about threat intelligence and realizing that, well, frankly, prevention is certainly a whole lot less expensive than the cure. So take a look at this map. The New York Times produced this fascinating study looking at the density of population and their distance to an emergency room. Now, the darker areas on this map indicated counties with 30 to 50,000 residents that live more than a 30 minute drive to an emergency room. Now, this is in normal circumstances. And this is just the drive time. It doesn't include, let's say, the time for an ambulance to get to you. 
imagine what this map might look like if a large regional system, like, for example, UHS, was taken down with ransomware for an extended period of time. Now, to put this in perspective, the goal pros for trauma and emergency medicine is to have a patient to definitive care in under an hour from the time the incident occurs. This is referred to as the golden hour in emergency medicine. And it's not a lot of time when you realize it includes the time for the ambulance to respond, to retrieve the patient and package them and get them to a trauma center. Now, if you start taking down an entire region of hospitals, diverting patients, you quickly realize the impact could be devastating in some parts of the country that are already far from the hospital as you start to break that golden hour. So now what I wanna do is I actually wanna turn the conversation to Robin and get a view of what, what happens on the inside, Robin, when all this goes down? What's the impact to staff and patients and well, the business of running a hospital when it's taken down by ransomware? What happens on the inside? <clears throat> These next few slides are based upon information from two separate healthcare organizations and what they went through. Please keep in mind that no two incidents are the same and organization responses will be different for each breach. Thankfully, this is not at my organization. However, we can all take this information and the lessons learned from them to help better plan for an attack and how to handle the response. Now, let's dig a little deeper into the timeline of these attacks with the real impacts they experienced. The attack containment lasted two weeks. <clears throat> Immediately, their electronic medical records system went down and claims processing stopped. Their expenses went up over time outside assistance and elective procedures were diverted. While the electronic medical record was down, they had 14 days worth of paper order, charges, and results piling up. That was enough to fill an entire conference room. During this time, they were also conducting investigations to determine if any electronic patient health information, also known as EPHI, was involved, and if there was a reportable privacy breach. Two plus weeks post-attack, the electronic medical records was back online, but other systems were still down. Cash reserves were now depleted. All those paper documents began being entered and scanned into the system. Think about how much paper it takes to fill an entire conference room. Now think about what that workload is to get all that entered and scanned into the system. Huge effort. Nine plus weeks post attack, the first claims were finally getting paid. Cash deficit reached $100,000 per bed. 26 weeks post attack, so six months later, all back, up, all back claims were submitted and paid, but there was a 6 to 10% 10, 10, 10 reduction in revenue due to the loss charge capture. In the end, a 200-bed facility in a competitive market never fully recovered. From an org-wide perspective, in addition to the downtime, they had to open and staff an incident command center 24-7. The paper processing was being done for nearly everything, and younger staff weren't familiar with their paper downtime procedures. Thank goodness for seasoned nurses. They needed many runners to go everywhere, pick up lab orders, et cetera. Their downtime boxes were only designed for two or three days. They ran out of forms and prescription pads and had to print, use a print shop to, for things they could get printed. Paper order sets were found to be old and outdated versions. When I first heard about these, I shared them at our daily IT huddle, as they are things you might not think about. IT does a great job about keeping systems up, but we also need to help the organization think about the impact should these systems go down. There was confusion and inconsistency regarding backloading of data and charges. From a clinical perspective, without access to hospital computer systems, doctors and nurses are communicating by fax, in person, or phone. That is, if the fax and phone lines are up and running. Medical records shows that patient treatment history our patients' treatment history are inaccessible, and the x-rays, CAT scans, and other medical tests can't be easily shared. Caregivers don't see dietary needs, allergies, or medication lists. Normally, basic information to tend to these in-house patients. These all pose potential patient safety issues. New records and patient registration information are being recorded on paper, and some patients have to be transferred to other hospitals. System impact. IT had to focus on payroll and materials management. You have to pay your staff and you have to order your supplies. 
There was no picture archiving and communication system, known as PACS, availability. Access to radiology and 2 and 3D images was a challenge. Operating room schedules were reviewed for elective or postponable procedures. Downtime information from the electronic medical records 724 or business continuation access systems lost nearly all value after only a couple days. The electronic medical record was never actually infected, but the limited workstations access made it virtually unusable. They had to focus on a few workstations in order to maintain an up-to-date census. The phones initially impacted because they were on the same network, then flooded once up and running due to the other systems still being down. From an IT and information security and privacy perspective, besides all the containment and remediation efforts, there are also those investigations that need to be conducted into determining if any electronic health record was involved and if there is a reportable privacy breach in addition to the security breach. The typical IT impact, staff burnout, mistakes, stress, and irritability are already high due to COVID and healthcare operations in general. But now throw in a cyber attack, and the loss of access to systems can push IT staff to the breaking point. They had to force a few stay-at-home days for some staff so they could recharge and come back refreshed. If you think about most IT shops, the IT people are working 24, 36 hours straight when there's an incident like this. They had stress and worry that any negative patient in outcome would be their fault. They were stressed and worried about missing something critical. The servers, the patients with critical cancer regiment data, access to old clinical data images, access to allergy data. The remediation services was not what was expected. They required obtaining extra staff from peer organizations and temp agencies. The recovery had many delays as previously noted, and then additional expenses of 250 to 500,000, not including new security hardware or software. Then there was the lost revenue. With no incoming cash flow while having all the additional expenses, they had a revenue reduction of $2 million. There was no progress on any IT projects for several months. And the cleanup is never 100% done. Even after a solid four months of enterprise-wide effort, it was still happening six months post-event. There was confusion and inconsistency of cleanup processes. There was no clear roles and responsibilities outlined. Some departments and clinics entered their own backload of data. Others had ancillary departments enter their orders and charges. A few did nothing, causing frustration and delays. There was finger pointing and comments such as it's not my job or burnout responses. There was missing data. They are still occasionally finding missing charge or order or results. The adverse impacts last a long time. The financial recovery following a ransomware event takes a minimum of six months and in some cases years. And even then, the unrecoverable costs are measured in the millions. There's potential regulatory fines and civil lawsuits. Financial penalties can be sanctioned by the Office of Civil Rights, known as OCR. The Attorney Generals can also sanction financial penalties if a breach of electronic patient health information breaches state legislation, and if it can be shown that an individual has sustained harm as a result of negligence of the covered entity or business associate, it is also possible for the individual to initiate a civil lawsuit for compensation. These can range anywhere between 100 up to in excess of 1.5 million for a breach. The lawsuits can be filed against organizations even when the breach occurred to one of your third party associates. So even if the breach isn't yours, if it's your data, your organization's responsible. When we get into loss of patients' trust that lead the patients to change where they receive care. And organizations that pay the ransom may face additional fines. U.S. organizations that paid ransom were targeted and attacked again with ransomware 73% of the time. 45% of U.S. companies hit with ransom attacked last year and paid at least one ransom, but only 26% of these companies had their files unlocked. Organizations that pay ransom may also be at risk by fines by the U.S. Department of Treasury's Office of Foreign Control. 
Thanks, Robin. That That's really a fascinating perspective. I mean, I, I just have this visual of this conference room full of paper as nurses and doctors have to switch to more manual means during an incident. Well, let's now pivot again and let's look at what's on the horizon and what adversaries are targeting next. And, and let's start this conversation by talking about vaccine producers in the cold chain. Now, the bad news here is there are a lot of signs of significant targeting. The good news, at least as of this recording, is that we're seeing targeting and breach disclosures, but not a whole lot of reports of material breaches. Now, every transfer during the vaccine production and distribution process represents a different potential attack point, as you can see on this chart. But just to give you an example of a few of the things that have happened so far, IBM X-Force researchers discovered in September of 2020, a COVID-19 phishing campaign targeting the cold supply chain by impersonating a business executive from a biological company, from a biomedical company, excuse me. Americold, the largest cold storage provider in the US disclosed in November that it had been the victim of a cyber attack. Might now, the German biotech supplier of SARS COVID-2 antigens impacted in a similar time frame as Americold. In February, Oxford University reported a breach in their structural biology lab where researchers were doing COVID-19 research. Microsoft noted in November that nation state actors were identified as targeting seven prominent companies directly involved in researching vaccines and treatments. And in February, South Korea's intelligence agency reports that North Korea attempted to obtain coronavirus related technology by attacking Pfizer. So again, as of this writing, lots of targeting, but no real significant impacts. Now, the next thing is we're creating new data during the pandemic. And one of those data elements we really haven't thought about how to secure and, or regulate. Now, you know, we've been sharing location data off of our phones and applications and the games we play and the, the mapping and GPS for years. But COVID-19 contact tracing data contains this really interesting new element that we all haven't thought through, who you associate with, not just where you've been, but who you're near. So think about what's in this data set for a second. Family, friends, coworkers, all right, that's obvious. Students and co-students. Frequent visits, like you know the gym, the hair salon, your office. But what's also in this are lovers, drug dealers, business associates. And there's very little consistency in how this data is being stored, if it's being regulated, and what happens to this data when the pandemic is over. So who we associate with is this entirely new data element we have not through, thought through how to address yet as a society, and what the implications could be, how it's stored, sold, or shared in ways we have just not considered. But it's not all about stealing data. Sometimes the bad guys just purchase it. FBI agent Ed Yu has been warning for years about the investment Chinese entities are making in the field of genomic sequencing. Now, China has gained significant access to Western genomic data and biological samples through research partnerships, investments, mergers and acquisitions. This literally includes US healthcare accreditations work with US hospitals, and even investment in 23andMe. The point here is if you're gonna do genomic sequencing, there's a very good chance the equipment, the laboratory, the foundational research, or the companies involved have a Chinese nexus. So a little bit of a case study, BGI Genomics, now this is the Chinese genomic sequencing powerhouse, was offering COVID-19 testing capabilities on a global basis. They sold or even gave away 35 million COVID-19 testing kits that were distributed to 180 countries. They then built 58 COVID testing laboratories in 18 countries. But in addition to the tests in laboratories, they were also requesting that researchers send the data generated on its equipment, as well as the patient samples, back to them. So they could be sequenced and shared in China's government-funded National Gene Bank. Now, for storing this data that BGI created, it has a partnership with a company that you may have heard of, Huawei. So again, this is all legitimate above board work, but it does raise some really interesting questions 
including a warning in February 2020 from the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, which resulted in multiple high-profile media reports, including coverage in Reuters, 60 Minutes, The Hill, and a bunch of others. So on to a new threat, changing data. Now, if an adversary modifies data, let's say in an electronic medical record, it is particularly problematic. There is no reliable secondary transaction record to validate the accuracy of an electronic medical record. There are no receipts. There's no traditional transaction logs or statements like with a financial record. And many patients cannot self-advocate for the accuracy of their medical record. So imagine if an adversary states they've changed medications on five patients, but you need to pay them a million dollars to know which ones. What are you gonna do in that situation? So a data integrity attack on even a single record breaks trust in the entire system, causing an immediate impact on patient care. And there are signs that this is already starting to happen. Hackers stole data from the European Medicines Agency and later leaked it including internal confidential email correspondence relating to the evaluation process for the vaccines. Now, here's the interesting thing. When this data was leaked, it was noted that the data appears to have been manipulated in an attempt to undermine public trust in the vaccine. So what I wanna do now is the RSA team wanted to make sure we all have some to-dos for you, some homework out of each presentation that you could apply when you got back to the office. So Robin and I came up with this admittedly somewhat cheesy metaphor, to articulate to executives the key things you need to have in place to prevent ransomware in a healthcare setting. Now, the reality is this, this could be applied to any market, but bear with me. First of all, we need some testing. So amid the pandemic, testing is critical to slow the spread. As ransomware attacks increase in healthcare, a compromise assessment unearths if an organization is currently infected, prepared, and resilient to withstand a breach. Screening is critical, both in public health and security. Now, how about some social distancing? Now, ransomware can find its way into the most protected environments. So a defensive strategy is all about preventing the spread. Sound familiar? Just like we see in social distancing as a strategy to prevent the spread of COVID-19, we need social distancing on our networks. So if a single department of an organization gets infected, it's imperative to stop the spread from infecting the entire organization. Network segmentation divides a computer network into smaller parts, which can limit the harm caused by, by ransomware. So the last thing you want is a small outbreak in one department taking down your entire system. And of course, we need some contact tracing. In a ransomware attack, the equivalent of contact tracing is endpoint detection and response, or EDR. EDR tools provide telemetry from every endpoint in the organization, allowing those IT teams to immediately identify risk at the first sign of infection while enabling an automatic quarantine as the team responds. And of course, to continue on our cheesy thread, we've got to have some masks, right? PPE. PPE goes beyond pandemics. Digital masks are needed to prevent networks from being corrupted. Now in security, this metaphor is really equivalent to multi-factor authentication. Based on access, an adversary will deploy tools to crack passwords and elevate their credentials. Multi-factor authentication will slow that adversary and potentially send them off to more vulnerable targets. And of course, if we're talking PPE, we need some scrubs and gowns. If medical professionals wore their everyday clothes into a sterile setting, their clothing would introduce unwanted pathogens. Implementing a privileged access management tool or conducting a PAM audit as it's often called can help detect any loopholes in privileged users and keep out the unwanted adversary. And just like we gotta go to the doctor, we need to get a checkup. And an annual checkup helps identify where individuals might need medical intervention or maybe a change in diet or exercise. In the same way, we need a checkup of our security controls with a security validation assessment. Now, what this is gonna do is it's gonna test your production environment against inoculated attacks to verify the people, the processes, and the technology respond appropriately. And then of course, we need a treatment plan. Just like doctors, if you get infected, we need to build a treatment plan for patients with a complex illness like ransomware. Time is of the essence and digital health of the organization hangs in the balance. Having an updated ransomware response playbook can easily guide leaders to manage, respond, and recover from that attack. Simply put, if you've got the ransomware playbook, the impact is probably gonna be a lot less. So if you apply these seven things to your security program, you can dramatically improve your risk posture relative to ransomware. And hey, 
It's a much more interesting way to explain the necessary security investments at your next board meeting. Okay, so now let's move up from the ransomware threat to looking at your overall security posture. Now the goalpost I wanna see all of you get to is something we like to call security validation. Actually verifying if your security controls are working properly in your production environment. So think of this as a four-step process. The first step, not new, get a third-party assessment and take this well beyond a traditional risk assessment or an interview where you sit down with an assessor. Get a third party to look at your controls, actively pen test the environment, scan for vulnerabilities, and conduct a compromise assessment, especially where we've had all these people working from home over the last number of months. A compromise assessment is so important as it helps you identify any endpoint that, you know, may have been compromised over the last number of months while people working from home or using workstations and tools that maybe you weren't so familiar with. Next, advance your program by remediating the issues found in that assessment. Now, if you're using a NIST assessment, you want everything above a three and headed towards a four on that one to five scale. Now, although this sounds simple, remember the statistic at the beginning of the presentation where 66% of America's healthcare providers could not get above a level three. And let's face it, that's really just the basics. So then let's also not forget the importance of managing processes and people. Do you have run books? Are they comprehensive? When was the last time you updated them? Simply put, the run book should be updated at least annually. You should be conducting exercises four times a year, twice an ounce, twice an ounce, and at least one of them should ideally be immersive and an all of business exercise versus let's say just a tabletop. Lastly, and this is one of my biggest takeaways for all of you, is to bring security validation into your program. Now, this technology has really advanced significantly, and it works by effectively launching inoculated attacks into your production environment. The tools then monitor your security logs to validate if, they, if the security controls, the people, the processes were working properly. So did the IPS detect the attack? Did the EDR fire? Did it properly correlate in the SIM? Did your SOC open a ticket? How long did it take? Was it dispositioned and investigated in a reasonable period of time? So again, think of security validation as your end goal. It can prove that the investments you've made in your security program are working and the team you have deployed is ready for anything. So the last takeaway in all of this is your supply chain. And let's face it, we've all known security, supply chain security is important, but it's largely been ignored since the target breach, which was, well, eons ago. But along comes the SolarWinds breach, the Microsoft Exchange vulnerabilities, and the focus is now on supply chain more than ever. So how do we better ensure the security of our supply chains? Well, let me introduce you to CMMC. Now, this is a US government initiative for securing the defense industrial base, specifically focused on military procurement in the controlled unclassified space. Now, the US government is losing 600 billion a year in intellectual property theft through America's adversaries. And CMMC is the answer to this problem. It involves a third party assessment for the security posture of a government supplier, leveraging a NIST based framework. And there are a couple of things about this though that are very different from a traditional assessment. First of all, is the scale of it. This involves 300,000 military contractors, and it will likely expand beyond that to other parts of the government, probably starting with the Department of Homeland Security. Let's face it, folks, if the US government figures this out, it is headed to the private sector, but it also has teeth. If you don't meet the minimum requirements, you are not gonna get awarded a government contract, hard stop. The assessors are credentialed, a rigorous set of ethical standards, quality review and security controls over the assessors and the companies they work for to ensure the integrity and quality of the result. And it is an impressive model. And I think it's likely where the rest of the industry is gonna head. So take a look, learn something new, and think about leveraging some of the CMMC practices in managing your own supply chain. So look, that gives you all a few things to think about, to take away and some homework to do when you get back to your office. Prepare for ransomware, add validation to your security program and start to get serious about your security supply chain. With that, Robin and I would love to open it up for some questions.